so what I'm going to do is just um, give a couple of examples of some um, candidates I've supervised and then I'm going to jump into a project that I'm trying to sort through at the moment because I thought it might be useful to try to sort of throw, you know, move through that struggle of, of situating in something that's not yet resolved. Um, I guess the first thing I wanted to say though was that I, I have examined quite a few now and PhDs that is. Uh, hold on, I'm just going to put it on to... And uh, this issue of how you situate and, and articulate the contribution is dealt with really differently by different people and when people take a, a fairly template approach to it, it's really obvious so they kind of have their chapter on what's what is otherwise called the lit review, where they run through a series of practices and then they move on to their practice and they blah, blah, blah. I personally find that aggravating because it, set, it sort of um, often leads to um, a, a sort of a lack of depth in the way that someone is, is really thinking about those examples in the field and how their work relates to it because it's kind of templated out. Um, you know, in this, one of the things that interests me about creative practice research is the degree to which things are integral to one another. So, um, so in say, if you were doing um, something in the sciences, your, your lit review might be about other people who've done um, who've done experiments related to the same problem that you're dealing with and how they've done it and where they've got. You might be doing some repeats to verify certain things, but. They're kind of they're, they're over here, same in the same similar way that um, you might adopt a certain methodology that other people have done and named in order to extract certain information about something, and here it just becomes a lot messier and a lot more I think more really interesting but um, different. And um, the first example I just wanted to to, to draw upon was um, Adele Varco, uh, who did um, this is her masters that she did a little while ago. Uh, so she didn't have to articulate the contribution to such a degree, but she, she did obviously have to situate it. And she did a thing called the, 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 the Skin Project, and she's a fashion candidate. She was folding skin as a way of dressing bodies. And you can see that folding on, in that case there. So the way in which she dealt with, um, this is her, this is her um, dissertation. And it's a fashion, it's done as a trashy fashion mag. Um, so the entire, and it did have like this thing around the outside, um, which we referred to as the sealed section, that has kind of like the meta text on it, which sort of um, stood outside of the project, if you like, um, to explain um, the research. But um, I'm going to pass this around so you can have a look at it, because I, I think it's a really interesting example of the degree to which one's creative practice can become absolutely integral to the way in which a dissertation is put together. Um, and the way in which she dealt with um, the contribution, uh, her, her field of practice was, um, so that's her editorial, which is written by her, Adele Varco, but she's, that's the only time Adele appears. Um, she's just the editor and then there's the contributors. And this is obviously her folded to be each one of those contributors, but this is mapping out her, her um, that to which she feels she's contributing. Uh, so um, there's a research by practice, which is, um, uh, here we are, Pat Downton, which is actually Peter Downton, who you've seen, a le who's a written books on design research. So she folds everybody's names into a fictional character um, to then, and that each one of those people either interview her or write an article or whatever. And so she, I mean, the work moves across, obviously, highly experimental fashion, very popular notions of fashion, as well as performance practices and art. So she was kind of mapping out these different terrains through these different characters that appear in the in the text. I thought it was I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> I thought it was really clever. But I'll just pass this um, around so you can have a look at it and the way in which she unfolded the experiments through uh, in the research that, that led to that. So that's one way in which. Uh, Mapping out the contribution, uh, or situating it, I should say, was done in a very in a way that was very integral to the practice. Um, another example I'll just talk about very quickly um, was an architecture an architect. Um, he uh, really wanted to take his practice into um, 
these particular kinds of digital techniques, parametricism. He'd just finished a master's overseas in that territory, but he's come, he'd come from New Zealand where he'd been educated in a very modest um, form of New Zealand modernism. They couldn't be more um, far apart as sort of modes of, of approaching architecture. But he wanted to kind of leave that New Zealand thing and go into this other thing. But the further we went through the, um, the process of the PhD, he realised that actually that kind of, that very sort of pragmatic humility of the New Zealand modernism and, and, and love of materials and such forth was actually really important to him. And so he ended up situating the, um, the whole PhD as, um, as a contribution to both areas, but where parametricism was informing a mode of modernist composition. So he was understanding a modernist form of composition very differently because he'd been through this whole parametric kind of journey but the contribution really was back to New Zealand modernism. So he was situating it, if you like, between those two things or sort of in this New Zealand world but inflected by the other thing. And so it was absolutely integral to what he was doing. It wasn't sort of like, oh, here's a field over here and this is what I'm doing, which is somehow related to it. It actually was deeply informed by, by those um, practices. and. Oh, that's just the, the, the sort of the parametricism above. And he's got this, this is his class, this is this diagram he, he assembled. It's very hard to, it's, it's kind of hard to explain without going into lots of detail. And then the new sort of New Zealand modernism. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about my PhD because my PhD was um, examined by thesis. However, um, uh, it was called The Aesthetics of Emergence and um, it did involve a, a whole lot of, of projects and so um, just to give you a sense of that background, that PhD dealt with sort of like a whole series of these kinds of drawings, a whole series of these kinds of sculptural objects and then these three major installation works, um, uh, Skins of Intimate Distance, Intimate Transactions with Keith Armstrong, we just did one component of that, the haptic feedback. Uh, system, and then the shower, which I did with Bruce Mouse, and um, which was a, another installation. And all of these works were just uh, highly experiential, and I was interested in looking at what you might call process-based composition. So how you can think about, like in architecture, if you think about composition, it's generally um, understood sort of as an archaic idea almost that it's about the arrangement of forms. Um, whereas I was interested in, given the um, emphasis on process-based um, approaches to architecture and my interest in process philosophy as well, that how can you think about composition in a process-based way? And so um, I would say that in this uh, particular PhD, the contribution was to architectural theory more than it was to practice because I used the practice to inform the theory. Now, most of the time we're going the other way around. Um, in our practice-based research, you might use theory and philosophy to inform your practice and to inform ways of thinking about what you're doing, but you're situating it within um, a field of practitioners. So, um, yeah, so, so that was... But, however, in the same way that Craig's saying, you know, looking back, you know, he could have done it really differently, I also could have done it really differently. And I could have done it as a, a by-practice PhD and it would have been a, a very different entity. Um, some, sometimes I'm really tempted to do it again. And that's, um, <laughs> that's maybe perhaps what I'm doing right now because um, I'm, I want to sort of talk about a way of situating this particular project that I'm doing now, which is called Avery Green. And um, I've recently started to think about this project as, or, or been interested in thinking about this project as if I was doing an emerging career PhD. So I, I'm particularly interested in PhDs that establish a practice and develop or, and or develop upon, um, as opposed to say one that, that deals with a vast body of work and reflects upon it and, and therefore articulates a whole lot of, of knowledge that has been well developed. And this project in a sense might be, well be, um, could be, I'm, I'm sort of pretending 
I'm not even pretending. I actually am kind of really interested in sort of shifting my practice and um, uh, using this project in that way. And so I thought, well, how about I do a thought experiment and try to think about what would, if I was doing a PhD and this was the main project, how would I deal with it? Um, Avery Green is a house. And so, as you saw before, most of my practice is not, I mean, I always framed those installations as a form of architectural practice, but it's not really something most people would recognize as being an architectural practice. It looks more like an art practice, which it kind of is as well. This is, um, I'm going, okay, I think I'm going to try and play architect now and in a more recognizable form. However, <laughs> however, um, uh, this, um, so, okay, so this is a house. I'm doing an, an extension and renovation to this house that's called Avery Green. Um, the, what I was interested in doing in this project was, um, as someone said to me at one point, what are you, who are you doing the house for? Are you doing it um, for yourself or for a client? And I said, I'm not doing it for either. I'm doing it for the house. And I'm really interested in the idea of trying to think about buildings entirely differently um, as a person. So part of the way through this project, I was asked um, to do a TED talk. Deacon did this sort of TED series. So I, and I thought, no, I can't do that. I'm really busy on this project. And then I thought, oh, no, this is my per the perfect chance to talk about this project. So the crux of the project becomes, you know, can a building be a person? What happens? What difference does it make if we think about buildings in that way as opposed to um, as some sort of form of property, for instance, like wives used to be, for instance? What happens if we think about um, buildings as non, not as property but as something with integral qualities unto itself? So it turns out that it's quite easy to actually remove the idea of person from a human, even though it's often related to, um, like this definition, in general usage, it's a human, a person. However, it also in legal terms, it refers to, you know, a firm, labor organizations, partnerships, associations, corporations, et cetera, et cetera. Basically anything that has rights and responsibilities. So what happens if a house has rights and responsibilities? It's also, as many of you are probably aware, you know, there's um, been the, the recent cases about the chimpanzees in, in a, uh, held as experimental subjects in a university and there's been a case trying to argue that Leo and Hercules are, are, have personhood and that therefore they have these rights. Um, similarly, um, there is a river in New Zealand which relatively recently was given legal personhood. So to be a person, you don't have to be a human. So then that moves on to the, the naming, and I had been, uh, you know, interested in this naming issue. And Victorian, the house itself um, is a Victorian terrace. Many houses from the Victorian era were named. Here's Fairley, Nord, and Derwent. Here's Helen. I like Helen. And um, and also Leslie and Norman. These are just, and and you know, there's millions of these all around Melbourne. Um, and so. Avery, but then I looked at what happens in architecture, and I went to the all of the in the residential category in architecture those architects who um, had uh, projects that had been shortlisted, and I looked at what they called them, and these are the kinds of things they get called. So they're not given a name like a person; they're given a descriptive name that describes something about that house. Um, as, a, as an entity and about the, the way in which the design is approached. And before I called the house Avery Green, I was calling it the downside up, outside in house for various reasons, the things that I was working through in relation to the, in the Victorian nature of the house and such forth. Um, so I was, in that, in that moment, I was doing the same sort of thing as this. Um, and suddenly by calling her Avery Green, I've sort of shifted slightly away from that while also referring back to that. So I suppose in one sense then I'm thinking, well, you know, I am really interested in situating this project inside of what you would see as um, a practice, sort of like a 
well, contemporary architectural practice, particularly around the terrace house. This is the cover of a book you might have seen in bookshops re come out relatively recently. It's all about the before and after of terrace houses in Melbourne and Sydney largely and a couple other places. Architects are, 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 are sort of fascinated by this as a, as a sort of typology and the way in which they can transform this very familiar, um, I think very, you know, the, the Victorian type into, into this contemporary mode. So I'm, I'm interested in situating it in relation to that, um, but obviously um, feeding back into it in a, in a slightly different way. In a slightly different way in a number of ways, one of which would be um, that I, I wasn't just the architect on the project, I was the builder. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I didn't physically do a lot of the work, I, but I was managing the whole process. And so the material kind of um, specificity and unravelling of the project, this is the back of the, of the house. So you, I showed you the front before. This is the, the back and the demolition and the, and the um, addition to the back. I'll just let that run through. So this project is still going. Like um, she's almost done, but she's not. She's not finished. So um, and that's my super fast time lapse. So that's my favourite part, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So the house is um, just to give you a quick sense of the, of the plan, which is not showing well here at all for some reason. But really, that's just a quick sketch of the of the extension. Um, it's just a kitchen um, on one end, and then the bathroom, which was down here, has done, now been stretched out into a long seven metre by one metre skinny thing down the side of the house. So that's the bathroom there, and that's the the kitchen and. Um, one of the things that I was interested in doing with it, here's a couple of photos from it um, in process, is to draw out of the, of, um, well, to engage with the house in, in everything that I knew about it. I mean, I've, I've lived in this house as well as I don't live there anymore, but um, I, I know her very well and I found all sorts of things about her history um, in the process of the demolition in particular, but um, I was really interested in drawing out of her that Victorian past and bringing her back to, she's kind of had a bit of a mongrel history in the sense that she's been adjusted a number of different times um, in, in kind of in some very odd ways so that her Victorianness had been compromised to some extent. And I was um, interested in drawing out of that um, Victorian past um, particularly the relationship that Victorians had with nature and the greenhouse and the winter garden and the conservatory, um, which is then sort of drawn forward as well as then the whole, this whole kind of picket fence thing that is sort of often associated with the Victorian house, but kind of turning it on its head. So this is the bathroom and that will be full of, of plants at some stage. So the, the idea is that becomes like a hybrid bathroom come winter garden and the, the kitchen literally has um, a garden inside behind the kitchen, the island kitchen bench. So instead of where in the island normally where people sit with their stools, you, you have um, this other little world there. And I've, I put, instead of ceiling roses, I put mountains, volcanoes and stuff on the ceiling and a few things like that. So thinking about then the community of practice um, that this house might be part of uh, is both very general and very specific. And so um, as I mentioned, there's the whole architectural world of, of the terrace house and the extension and renovation. Then there's the Victorian winter garden, which um, is another type. So we've got these two types. Um, the, the elemental nature of the, of the project, and I won't go too deeply into that, but um, goes back way into architectural history. One of the reasons she's called Avery as well is that there is... Um, a thing called the Avery Index, which is um, based, it, which is basically the name for the index of architectural periodicals. So she's referring back to that architectural history in her name. Um, 
and there's this whole history of the elemental in architecture which is coming back at the moment, which I'm interested in referring to and thinking about through the project. Um, but then there's these two other very specific um, houses that have informed the way in which the house has been approached um, and that feed into the develop the transformation of her character. Because this is a character transformation as well as a um, kind of like a pulling out of her backstory. So one being the Featherston House by Boyd, which is in Melbourne, um, and that's got uh, like the it, it, it is basically a big greenhouse in many respects. And then there is the Bias Cleave House, um, which is in New York by Arakawa and Gins, who are an architect artist couple who've done this really, um, I think, very interesting experimental architecture in which they um, really try to shift um, one's perception of space through the way in which they design things. And obviously that floor is, is, is a little bit of a challenge to the way in which might th one might think about a living space. But they do all sorts of things. And that's sort of the, the downside up, outside in part of the project is really coming out of this. And the rest of it's kind of coming out of um, architecture. And, and obviously it's a, it's the, in, if you take that, that bias cleave house and feed it into those other, you kind of normalise it a bit. But it, it becomes a tamed version of the of the wild experiment. Yeah, there's all this stuff about tameness and wildness. But I wasn't very happy with that um, additive model. So I, I just tried out last night a little equation about how you might relate those those elements of that community, if you like, or those those issues and aspects being that perhaps it's the um, pi times with creating this circular world. Um, with the terrace house to the power of the bias cleave, plus the winter garden to the power of the Featherston over um, Logier there times time. I'm not quite sure what to do with that, but it was a different way of pulling together the relationships between those parts. So um, the the um, in terms of what this might also be contributing to. Uh, and the way in which I would situate it is in terms of research by practice and creative practice research. So there is one um, project that I have been involved in over many years, which is um, the, the Sense Lab in, based in Montreal with Brian Masumi and Erin Manning. And in Canada, they talk about research creation um, as opposed to research by practice, but it is based around this. Um, so philosophy in action. Thought, a laboratory for thought in motion. So there, that's very um, grounded in process philosophy. Um, I'm uh, interested in the status of the object in relation to process. So the house as a person, as a thing that is made of interdependencies, then becomes oddly situated in this context. So they're very interested in the pre-personal. So to introduce a person into the pre-personal is a, is a, is a slightly um, counterintuitive thing to do. And yet, to me, there is, there's all sorts of issues. I mean, I could talk for ages about that particular issue, about dealing with practice in process philosophy and the status of the object. And I've, I've just written a paper for a book in that series, or as part of a series that they're doing, about this project to try to tease through those issues there. And then there's just this... Um, in architecture, the split between theory and practice. Um, I mean, in the 90s, theory was big, and then there was something called the post-critical, and um, no one, you know, Deleuze became not something that um, everyone was interested in, but basically a dirty word. So, you know, theory, you know, took on a different turn, and I think that that split, um, which is still, I think, still in place, but is shifting. Um, is something that I'm very interested in contributing to because what I'm wanting to do with this project is to try to make it extremely difficult to separate theory from practice and vice versa. And um, part of, and, and I presented this project at a conference in the UK called this thing called theory, the one before, 
about theory as a practice amidst an ecology of practices and that um, this theory practice split being not so easy to do through this project and, and how that was playing itself out. It's called the Jane approach because the Avery Green has a sister project, if you like, called the Jane approach. And this is really a methodological thing, I guess, because what I'm doing is saying, well, what I'm interested, I'm interested in developing Avery Green at the same time as I'm developing an approach. And that approach is called the Jane approach after three Janes. One of them is Jane Goodall, who um, named her subjects controversially. Um, all of the, the chimpanzees were given um, names. She was criticised heavily for that. I also found this beautiful little passage in her 1971 book. I found myself saying good morning to my little hut on the peak, hello to the stream where I collected my water after having been in the forest alone for a year. And I sort of feel like um, uh, Jane Goodall uh, took that approach and, and did some really remarkable things with it where she, she didn't see that same split as is often assumed in research. And she also, um, I guess, saw a sort of relatively flat hierarchy in the way that she operated. And that's something I'm trying to develop through this. Um, and then there's Jane Bennett. Um, many of you are probably aware of her. She, people are talking about her work a lot at the moment. Um, this book, Vibrant Matter, and she's, uh, and, and the Enchantment of Modern Life. But she's interested in what's called a vital materialism. Um, where she talks about the call of the object and um, I think um, crucially she talks about anthropomorphizing as a way of working against anthropocentrism um, because a chord is struck between person and thing in the way. So I'm drawing on that quite heavily as well, Jane Bennett and Jane Goodall and the relationship between them as well as Jane Jacobs who in many respects anthropomorphized the city. Um, and the way that she understood it and she uh, was passionate about that which was particular about the city, about every city and every city being a different city, like every house is a different house and every person is a different person and they have to understand it from the bottom up, from really from that material activity in the street as opposed to um, uh, from above. And so and this is just a quote from her, and what is a habitat? It's an intricate, complicated web of interdependencies. And I would say that that's probably what a person is as in relation to... I'm not talking about the Jane approach here. I'm only talking about Avery Green. But um, towards what I would... I'm, I'm actually starting to think of it as a post-anthropocentric architecture, but as an, also as a sort of in line with Jane Bennett's vital materialism. So... But it, it is very much coming out of the act of making something as opposed to um, theorising away from the act of making. So I think in the end, what I'm, I'm still working this out, um, this, whole, this whole project, which is why I was kind of interested in, in thinking it through in this context. But I suspect what, in the end, the best way of, of, of situating this and articulating a contribution will be around trying to find a way to garner an approach that has an ethical agenda and we'll talk a bit more about ethics next time but it has an ethical agenda but which is both materially specific enough and abstract enough at the same time to be equally relevant to both theory and practice and that those two things don't have to be separated but in fact that they that they operate together and so it's kind of that is a makes it a practice based phd I might just finish with one very short story and then we'll, we'll have a chat. But I went to see a lecture recently um, by Richard Schusterman, who's a philosopher, um, and he's written a, uh, stuff called, uh, like, On Somesthetics is his main thing, which is philosophy through the body. I've always been really interested in that, um, in, what his, in his writing, and um, he's you know, written a lot about aesthetics and the body and body practices. He's become a certified Feldenkrais practitioner. He's done all this bioenergetics and, and he did this lecture and he showed us these kind of performative pieces that he'd done in a gold lycra bodysuit where he was dancing around the gardens um, responding to things. And this was in the context of a whole lot of artists who, um, many of which you could tell were very annoyed with him <laughs> because he was um, uh, kind of doing art slightly badly, 
um, and, and talking about this contribution to bodily knowledge and such forth. And uh, I said to him at one point, look, and he was getting a bit of a hard time because people were saying, you know, uh, heaps of people in theatre practices and such forth have done a whole lot of really refined work in this area and what are you doing? And, um, and then I sort of said, well, look, you know, like, if you're an artist, you can turn to philosophy and theory to change your habits of attention and that might shift your practice. Like, it can, it can have a contribution to your practice, but the contribution that you're making is to art practice. Similarly, you're a philosopher and you've had this sort of um, moved into art practices and, and various other body practices, how has that shifted the way that you philosophize? How has that changed the way in which you might form a concept, for instance? And he couldn't really answer the question, which was very disappointing, because that was the point, I thought, of the whole thing. But it really struck me that he didn't understand research by practice, that he hadn't actually grasped the idea that philosophy was a practice that these art practices might inform. And so he was talk, think, he's still thinking about philosophy as a thing over there, which does something, rather than as a practice that he was doing that he might be able to... Um, and it sort of crystallised that, that issue for me of understanding what research by practice is and what, what practice you're actually uncovering. Okay, I'm going to leave that there. And we should um, have some questions.